It's raining subpoenas and a whole lot of crazy. The breakdown starts now. Welcome to The Breakdown. I'm Tara Setmayer. This is the Rick Wilson. And we have a great show coming up for you today. In a few minutes, we will have the DC Bureau Chief and author, um, Mother Jones, DC Bureau Chief and, and author, author David Korn coming up on the show to talk about his new book, which <laughs> Rick and I can relate to. It's called American Psychosis, yes. a historical investigation of how the Republican Party went crazy. It's out today. Uh, I'm looking forward to reading it, actually. Absolutely. Uh, but David Korn is a fantastic writer, and he's been really uh, out front on a lot of the, the Trump crazy over the years. And so looking forward to that conversation with him. So stay tuned. We're also debuting another ad for you guys. Uh, we just put it out today, but we're going to show preview it again for you today mm -hmm. if you haven't seen it yet. So stay tuned for that. And it's Tuesday, Rick. So you know what that means. As always. Let's see what happened last week in the crazy Republican Party. How many of you miss Donald Trump? Democracies function on the principle that the losing side concedes defeat and the winning side. I agree with it. Takes over when you lose. Trump won, Biden's illegitimate. This is 100% evidence. There's no one that's done more for Christianity than Donald Trump. The Americans remember how good we had it under President Trump. I mean, MAGA, let's face it, had one bad day. You can call us extremists. You can call us domestic terrorists. You know who else was called a lot of names his whole life? Jesus. In Washington, D.C., the problem is there's not enough of me. Twenty-one years ago, the threat was jihadis armed with box cutters and mace. Today, it's one of America's two political parties. It's the Democrat Party and their henchmen. It was the worst day of my life. And in some ways, you know, the greatest day of my life. I'm hugging it and petting it. Oh. Ron Johnson's going to win. We invested with him He's early. He's behind by about early. five points right now, right? Yeah. Everybody says you're going to lose, but you don't lose. Wow. You're going to win. That's what they always say. You're going to you're going to be fine. All right. <laughs> it's the gay, porno, abortion, feminist, diabolic empire. That's what America stands for. Your critics say it wasn't appropriate to call out a man who just suffered a stroke for your campaign to question his eating habits. I'm just clarifying you stand by with the campaign statements. Yes. I have not yet begun to fight. Here we go. Let's get loud. Let's get loud. Turn the music up. Let's do it. Come on, people. Let's get loud. Let's get loud. Turn the music up to hear that sound. Let's get loud. Let's get loud. Ain't nobody. <laughs> oh, my God. I could... I could use less of Kimberly Guilfoyle shaking her ass on on stage. Uh, you know, apparently you had to have a ticket, a lanyard, and a stack of a stack of five dollar bills to go to that <laughs> show. Or, do or dollar bills, given that performance. I mean, uh, she is the worst. I encourage people to Google the Kimberly Guilfoyle lap dance hot tub scandal and finance and fundraising. Um, it's quite the read. We live in a country <laughs> where the future first lady of the United States has a Hot tub lap dance scandal. Rick, we already had a first lady that we saw spread out naked. To my knowledge, though, in in a, in a to my know. knowledge, though, there was never any working of the pole by Melania. Well, um, I, I well, I'm, I'm going to leave that alone. All I'm going to say is we've already had one of those as a first lady. So you know, I guess it's um par for the course. Given you know, I look at her dancing up there, and I'm thinking, find another way to disappoint your parents. Yeah. Good grief. What happened to her? Anyway, um, and, and this whole idea of, of these, these, ma these MAGA QAnon lunatics running around now comparing what they're doing to Jesus. This, this Jesus savior complex thing is just so, just so. 
but you know, it is, it is part of it is part of on the cynical political side. It's part of the fact that they recognize now that because of Dobbs, they've got to turn their evangelical base up even that's higher right. and adopt with them even more. That's exactly right. So that's, that's what they're doing. That's what's I think happening under the surface there, and including while we're taping this, that you know, Lady Lindsay is doing a press conference uh, pushing his new national abortion ban, a blanket ban on abortion. So see how that works out for you, Lindsay. That's how that's how desperate the Republicans have gotten because they see that in we've seen in the last couple of days all of these reports coming out of the momentum now shifting toward Democrats. The enthusiasm gap has been not only erased but eclipsed. Democrats are furious. Women are registering at record numbers because of the Dobbs case. They, you know, yeah. people are not okay with taking a right rights away from women. And now Republicans are tripling down with stuff like this. Stuff and I like keep going back to it. It's not about it's not about abortion. It's about liberty. That's correct. 100%. And, 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 and it became viewed by, by millions of non-pro-choice activists as a background right. They don't like this. Yep. But you'll continue. Please, Lindsay, keep doing that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, lots of good news on, uh, on the domestic front for, for Joe Biden and the Democrats. Great economic news. Yes, inflation is still a little high, but everything else, the dollar's doing great around the world. Gas prices are down. Biden right. had the Inflation Reduction Act ceremony at the on the South Lawn of the White House today, touting all of their accomplishments in that. Um, this is looking good for them. They need to keep this momentum up. It's post-Labor Day. This is where it matters. And so far... Um, that things are going in the right direction for Democrats, and we like that. However, things are not going in the right direction. <laughs> in Trump that. world, in Trump world, um, 40 subpoenas issued by the Justice Department. To that is a real people. shame. That is just a real, real shame. I, I, <laughs> I spent entire milliseconds last night thinking about the poor... Trump allies and acolytes and 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 various servants uh, of Trump and MAGA world. I spent entire milliseconds thinking last night, oh, this is going to cost them all so much and Donald Trump will have to cover their legal bills. And then I realized he'll never cover their legal bills. He doesn't cover his own legal bills. Um, <laughs> Boris Epstein, that bastard. I, I got a good chuckle when I saw Oh, him. I, I, I enjoyed that one. A lot. Me too. He was subpoenaed. A lot. By, he was subpoenaed by the January sixth committee too, and he disregarded that. Uh, right. You can't. You're not going to be able to get away from the Department of Justice. That's a whole different ball game. Yeah. Good. Good luck was. trying to trying to get trying to do that. That's right. That's right. So um, he's in some trouble. Dan Scavino, one of your favorites, uh, Rick. He yeah. he also subpoenaed by the Justice Department, and this is all about the Trump fundraising potential fraud with this Save America PAC um, yep. and yep. some other January 6th things. But um, this is Harry Littman, our good friend who comes on the show all the time, fe former federal prosecutor, host of The Talking Feds. Harry made a really good point about this, saying that a lot of the people, besides some of the more common names that we just mentioned, like Scavino and Epstein, but a lot of these people were lower level staffers. So they are not the kind of people that have millions of dollars to waste on legal fees right. or want to go to jail for Donald Trump. So they're more likely to talk and flip. And those are the ones. Look at Cassidy Hutchinson. Those are the ones, the foot soldiers that know a lot of what's going on and will be more likely to, to yap. So not looking good for Trump world. No, not at all. <laughs> did you did you see this thing? It looked like a like a mafia meeting. Trump has been losing his mind over this. Uh, the, you know, all I could think of course. was like the Soprano scenes where they're on the golf course, and and George Conway had a great tweet today. It was like, which Sopranos episode is this? And my answer was Pine Barrens. <laughs> oh, that is the greatest Sopranos episode ever. And by the way, it is um, absolutely it is it is a perfect hour of television. <laughs> It is. If it, I believe it, I believe they won brilliantly an written. For, I believe they won an Emmy for that. I think the so. Writing for that episode. And when we drive to Jersey, you know, I go down the shore all the time in the summer. We have to drive through the Pine Barrens to get there from coming from DC. And I always chuckle about the ketchup packets. Oh, right with me. <laughs> and the ketchup packets. And <laughs> then he was a Czechoslovakian interior. No, no, he was, a, he was a Russian. He's a Spetsnaz, former Russian Spetsnaz guy. 
Right, but he thought he said that he was a Czechoslovakian interior <laughs> designer, and he said his apartment looked like shit. <laughs> Anyway, if you guys haven't seen that episode of Sopranos or Sopranos at all, worth it's it. The greatest television ever made. Oh, uh, anyway. So, yes, these folks are in trouble. And the thing is, the National Archives isn't even sure they have everything. With right. all of this going on with the with the classified documents, with the the PAC being investigated now, it, it, it's a lot. It's a lot. No wonder Trump has been completely losing his mind over on Truth Social and just the video that we've seen of him lately. I dipped into Truth Social good. last night and looked through the stuff he's retweeting and tweeting. And I'm thinking, okay, Papa, time for bed and your medicine. Right? Yeah. He, he uh, more unhinged than usual, which is a lot to say right. there. Um, but, you know. It's a lot to take it's, in. It's a lot to take in. And your video last week and the Lincoln Project's um, – video oh, yeah. ad that we put out last week that just drove Trump up the wall. Yeah, it's over 3 million views, right? 3.3 3, 3. 4. 3. 4 on the ad oh. Sucker. And folks, if you haven't seen it, just go to our YouTube channel and check out Sucker. Also, like and subscribe. Um, or you can look on my Twitter feed. It's my pinned tweet of my response to Trump threatening to sue us, which has sent the it sent the MAGAs into an absolute oh. frenzy. How dare he use words like impotent and flaccid to describe the dear leader? I believe it was flabby. <laughs> flabby. Yes, I did. Impotent and flaccid are the same thing. <laughs> and I did also you know, call him impotent twice, including oh. the joke about Melania, which of course I had I had several people, even on the even on our side of the fence, were like, Are you sure you wanted to go there? That's very extreme. Oh. Please, have they have they paid attention to Donald Trump? Have they met me? Years? Yeah, and have they met Rick Wilson? People need to get over themselves. This is uh, you got to fight fire with fire. Sorry. <laughs> um, speaking of that, and then we're going to bring in David Corn. There's also good news on the Ukraine front. Um, the Ukrainians have 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 battled back and gained some territory back, the size of Delaware. The Russians are uh, regrouping, um, and. A lot of people never thought that we would get to this point. They thought Kiev would have been taken over in a week and this whole thing would have been a disaster and Russia was going to win. And the Ukrainians have fought their asses off and have fended off Russia and made them retreat to a, to a degree yeah. that no one thought. Now, it's far from yeah. over. There's still a lot that could happen, but that's good sure. news over there for the Ukrainians. Good for them. But we have seen in, in the last five, six days in Ukraine – the Russians have lost almost all of their territorial gains from their invasion of Ukraine. Yep. Um, the Ukrainians are pushing back hard and fast. They're driving very swiftly towards the borders now of Ukraine. And, and I think that it's going to be a very interesting moment coming up soon where they will have recaptured all the territory taken by Russia in this conquest. And then the question becomes, do they take back Crimea? Which I, I like Crimea. I think yeah. we should encourage them to take back Crimea, um, but it is a it is a tribute to the bravery and the skill Absolutely. of the Ukrainian armed forces. Yep. And and I, I saw something floating around last night where um, Matt Walsh had posted this Russian military recruiting video of these very you know macho Russian yeah. guys, and then he he's like, "This is why we're losing because you know our our sides use pronouns." <laughs> <laughs> I saw an Ukrainian cartoon on Telegram last night. And it's like, what's wow. your pronoun? Run. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's funny. That's funny. Well, good for the Ukrainians. They've been creative in this and diligent and incredibly brave. And uh, we're rooting for them. Uh, all right. Speaking of, let's bring in today's guest. David Korn, like I said. David. He's a veteran Washington journalist and political commentator. He is the bureau chief of Mother Jones and an analyst for MSNBC and the author of the new book out today, American Psychosis, about the roots of today's Republican extremism. And we know all about this. We fight it every day, David. Welcome to The Breakdown. Great to Welcome be back. with you guys. Yes. Good to be with you also, brother. And uh, I've got your book in my Kindle. I'm looking forward to reading it tonight. Um, right. Tell us about tell us about your take on the on the on the great descent of the GOP into madness. <laughs> well, you know, about a, I don't know a year and a few months ago, 
I was just thinking about the Republican Party relationship with extremism, far right fanaticism, conspiracy theory, you know, all the craziness that we've seen in the last few years. And I was just thinking about some of the historical antecedents. You know, I remember, you know, the Tea Party, Sarah Palin, Newt Gingrich, and I kind of said, there must be a book on this. I wanted to just read more, go deeper. And I discovered there wasn't a book on this. So, you know, be your own book, write your own book if you can't find one that you, the one that you want. And so I decided to go back and look at the modern history of the Republican Party to kind of figure out how we got to the point we're at today. And I've basically looked at the last seven decades starting after World War II in the 50s. And, I, you know, it's funny, even though, you know, you live through things and you've, you read through things, uh, you see a very clear pattern when you look for one. And that is that the Republican Party you know, since the late 40s, early 50s, has again and again and again encouraged and exploited extremism. And that could be bigotry, paranoia, uh, you know, tribalism, um, you know, grievances, fear, and all that sort of stuff. And it's been a consistent, steady part of the Republican project. And so what we're seeing with Donald Trump is not some, it's not an aberration. It's a culmination. It's something new, and he does it better and bigger than it's been done in the past. But, you know, starting back in with McCarthyism in the 50s, you had Joe McCarthy, an elected senator from the great state of Wisconsin, get out there and say that there was literally a cabal that was in charge of ruining America. That a cabinet member, I don't know why my hotel phone is going <laughs> off right now. It's I Donald mean, Trump calling you to tell you to, to uh, I you mean, know. Seriously. That's the last, a when was the last time you used a hotel phone? Right, right. Uh, right? You know, they, I don't even know why they have them anymore. But uh, it will probably stop ringing in a moment, um, as it just did. So if you go back and look at Joe McCarthy, his claim at the time was that there was a cabal of elected Democratic officials led by George C. Marshall, the Secretary of Defense, right. and Chief of Staff for the Army that won World War II, and that it purposefully was trying to destroy the United States from within so that the Soviet Union could take over. And this conspiracy included other Democratic officials, uh, Democrats throughout the land, media, and so on. It's a lot, it's a lot like QAnon, but without the baby eating and sexual trafficking in the basement of pizzeria. But it was a fucking crazy idea, yes. crazy theory. And the Republican Party said, yeah, this is great. It, it's winning. It's helping us win elections. And when Eisenhower campaigned with Joe McCarthy in 1952, he had had a speech, try to put a paragraph in a speech, kind of vaguely denouncing and distancing himself from McCarthy. And at the end, he dropped it, and he wouldn't say those words. And so Sounds you, know, you start thinking about this. Here was the Republican Party taking advantage of people's fears, grievances, paranoia at the dawn of the Cold War when nuclear terror was, you know, literally scaring people almost to death. And you can take that through line through Barry Goldwater making a, a, a accommodation, a partnership with the John Birchers, who are McCarthy who are basically McCarthyism and steroids. You yeah. can go up to 1968 and see Richard Nixon cutting a deal with Strom Thurmond and the white supremacist segregationists in order to get the Republican nomination. Law you know, and order. Extremists, you know, and, and turning his back on what he used to practice, right. which was the moderate Republican loyalty to the idea of civil rights. This is the party of Lincoln, right? And then you can go to the, you know, Ronald Reagan in the 70s and and late 70s and early 80s. And I know a lot of Republicans venerate Ronald Reagan. And, you know, I, I can understand that for ideological reasons and personal reasons. But in the late 70s, you had the rise of the new right and the rise of the religious right. It was sort of two you know, sides of the same coin. And they were developing this thing called direct mail, which was all based on scaring people. And Richard they Vickery. Out, you know, you, you know, sent out direct mail pieces saying that Democrats, liberals, and gays are, out, are trying to destroy America and Christianity. They're coming for your children. They want to gain, you know, they want to brainwash you and they want to take over America. It was vilifying and demonizing the other side. And you even had Jerry Fowell, who was leading the moral majority at the time, making statements like gay people want to kill us. They want to kill Americans. And you had a few members and leaders of the moral majority actually say homosexuality was a crime that could be punished with 
murder, with execution. That, that's in the Bible. And so Reagan, you know, this is not all he's doing, but he's endorsing and embracing these people, certainly legitimizing them. You have both George Bushes getting in bed with a Christian coalition, which is led by Pat Robertson, who is promoting the most lunatic anti-Semitic conspiracy theories about the Illuminati, the Rothschilds, the Federal Reserve, the Trilateral Commission, yeah, the New all World Order. of a literal, not figurative, satanic cabal to bring one world government that Lucifer will reign over. And know who's part of that? George H.W. Bush. Right. And they're going right. to his conferences. Republicans are flocking to his conferences and they're validating, authenticating this guy who is telling hundreds of thousands, millions of Americans the most crazy back crap things you can think of. And they're but, embracing the Christian coalition. It's producing votes and money for them. So why that, should they care about the other crazy stuff? And you know, that's that's kind of where we're how we got to where we are now. Yeah. Right. It's just so much because back then. You could, you didn't have social media. You didn't have, you know, everything on your phone. You could kind yeah. of, you could suppress the crazy part and just say, oh, these are just good Christians and we need their votes. And just like, no one really knows about all that other crazy stuff. Now it's a little bit different because there's a mm -hmm. lot more scrutiny, a lot more ability to disseminate that information on a lar much larger scale. And we've reached a, an, an inflection point, I think, in this country now with Donald Trump that is literally threatening our, the, our democracy every single day. And you, you talk about two types of fascism that's kind of going on within the Re Republican Party. Mm -hmm. You talk about snowflake fascism and gaslight fa fascism. Explain that. Yes, uh, these are pieces that I've written recently. Yeah. And snowflake fascism is basically, <laughs> you know, you have, as I've just sort of laid out and I could continue the history forward, you have decades of Republicans demon and, cons and conservatives demonizing, you know, liberals, progressive Democrats, and saying they are trying to destroy the country. And even during the 2020 campaign, you had Donald Trump out there saying that Biden, working with Antifa, Black Lives Matter, uh, radical communists, wanted to impose far left fascism. That was his word, far left fascism. And then you know you have Ben Shapiro calling one of Biden's speeches, 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 excuse me, fascism. And then so here comes Biden. After you have a president who tried to overturn an election, encourage a violent insurrection, and you have a Republican Party that now supports a guy who recently said he would pardon right. the brown shirts that he said on the Capitol who beat up cops and tried to overthrow the election and talked about killing Mike Pence. They take offense when you say that might be semi-fascism. Right. I mean, they've been calling Democrats fascists and, and demonizing them for years, for decades. But you come along and try to say your threat to democracy, you know, has the scent of fascism. And they go, oh, you can't say that. You can't do that. Unfair. They want to blow the whistle. I you know, it, it is it, it, it's a rule that I've I've had for a long time now about the current GOP. Every accusation is a confession. Yes. And yeah. And, you know, they're screaming, Joe Biden's the fascist. He's the real fascist. These people are not like, as I call it, just the tip fascism. They're all in now. <laughs> they they believe in the sort of post small D democratic systems in this country. And I think it I think that like all these foundational things and you and I might disagree on like some of the the, the qualifiers in the in the stuff that came before. But I think we all agree now that they are fully into a post constitutional pro-authoritarian frame where they, they're saying the quiet part out loud now. Well, Just you look have at Florida, look at Florida, what Ron DeSantis is doing, what they're heralding there. I mean, that's um, pretty fascist in a lot of ways. You got to be kidding me, but it's all, you know, oh, but it's all in the name of owning the libs. Sorry. Go ahead, yeah. you, if you look, you know, the leading Republican candidate uh, in New Hampshire in the primary up there was in favor of getting rid of the 17th Amendment that allows for direct election of senators. So it's like his it's like his motto is, his slogan is, vote for me and I'll take away your vote. I mean, that's literally right. what he is right. saying to right. the people out there. And you have Mastriano, and uh, Doug Mastriano running for governor in Pennsylvania who's taken a similar line. So yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, the way I kind of lay it out in American Psychosis is that I do see a lot of trends and they've waxed and waned, and the Republican Party has dealt with them in different ways, sometimes more accepting, sometimes a little more distancing, but it's always been there. It's never been put off for decades, 
and it just has kept continued to intensify. And then to your, your point, Tara, with the advent of social media and a separate conservative media ecosystem and ecosystem, you know, it has you know expanded the way a virus hits a certain turning point, right? When it goes from just here, here, and here to a massive pandemic, which we've all just lived through. Uh, so, so, that, so there is something different now. And while in the past, I would argue that I do think Republicans, you know, were trying to make it harder for people to vote in certain areas and gerrymandering, which Democrats did too, and just trying to rig the field or maybe say tilt the field in their direction as politicians do. I do think to your point, Rick, that they've crossed a certain Rubicon and gone from what I would call in the past to being quasi anti-democratic in certain ways to now being we don't really need democracy, you know, right. democracy. And you have people like Peter Thiel and J.D. Vance and Blake Masters who have actually said this stuff for years. Yes. That maybe, you know, we need to move past democracy to have a more efficient, effective state. Peter That's Thiel wrote were... it in a book in 2009, two, as yes. far back as 2009. Right. And, and look, now this guy is bankrolling all these candidates. Weekend, where he was basically laying out the case for, for Republican slash you know, MAGA uh, executive action against co companies and businesses that don't agree and fall into line with their ideological premises. That you said DeSantis, I, you and I were yeah. talking at the same time. DeSantis did that, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's fascist. <laughs> like, hello. Yeah. Attacking private business like that is fascist. Telling, telling businesses what they can produce. Right. Hmm, I've heard this before somewhere in an yeah. Italian accent. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> no, right? I mean, that, that to me, and, and I was talking to Charlie Sykes earlier, and one of my favorite parts of doing this book is talking to Republicans, recovering Republicans, recovering conservatives. I had a great conversation with Joe Scarborough this morning uh, because I know the, the way I, I frame things and cover things, it's going to be uncomfortable for people who, you know, who were attracted to what they thought was the, the better side of the Republican Party for, you know, a lot of their, for a lot of their life. And, you know, and, 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 and you talk to, you, you see that there has just been, like you look at DeSantis, there's just no questioning of it, right? He gets out there and he takes a position that is distinctly non-conservative, yeah. non-small G government, you right. know, non in favor of businesses. And, you know, forget whether you want to argue the pros or cons of that policy, but that's always what Republican Party has has strived for right and whether it's wrong or it's right what's to me is striking and it's what charlie and i talked about was there was no peep there was no one even in the party who said well wait a second we shouldn't do this let's at least yeah. have a debate as republicans right this is not a very republican thing to do now you guys attack them. yeah i was gonna I say we that. tried we tried but that but before lincoln people project are still, <laughs> people are still within the party i mean they were in the democratic party you, you know, you bring five people together and there are 10 different arguments. They're always <laughs> arguing about what they should do as a good Democrat. A good Democrat does it, a good Democrat does that. And sometimes it's, you know, that hurts the party, but sometimes it helps the party. But it's free-flowing and honest conversation. Okay, Manchin has his perspective, AOC has her perspective, and they, you know, they fight it out. In the Republican Party, we now have an absence of discussion and debate. So Ron DeSantis pulls off a stunt like that, and there's not a single really elected Republican who comes out and says, well, I don't think, I don't agree with that. I don't think that's a good thing. Um, I still see you as a Republican. I'm still a Republican. The party has just become, you know, MAGA parrots. Yes. And, you know, right? And and I think that's, and I think it's bad in the sense for the outcomes, but also in what it teaches or shows the rest of America about the need to have conversation. We're a big country, a lot of disagreements. We need to be able to talk about stuff, even if you end up losing that policy fight. You know, Rick, you and I have probably disagreed a lot over the years, and sometimes you've won, sometimes the side I like wins. And But we've always thought that, you know, by and large, the rules are kind of fair, and if you don't no. win now, you're going to win again. Yeah. And there's no such thing as a total takeover by one right. side or the other. Right. And that's kind of what MAGA wants. Which is, right. which is why what happened on January 6th was just so uh, upsetting and so incredibly damaging 
to American democracy, not only in the act itself, but the premise on, on which it was it was perpetrated on. It was, you know, a lie about the peaceful transition of power and a free and fair election. That right. is the foundation of our democracy here. That 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 the constitutional republic that we have that distinguishes us from so many others. And that was the heart of our country was at it was under attack that day. And Republicans who at the time knew better, said so, but then were so quick to reverse it because they were scared to death of, of losing power or being punished by the MAGA cult for speaking the truth. And the fact that they were so willing to abdicate that is what makes this such a dangerous um, uh, party now and such a threat to our democracy. I want to, uh, you, you said this as, as, we, as we wrap this up, you said, we're, we're living in a world where, quote, a narcissistic, racist, misogynist, ig ignorant, loudmouth reality television celebrity can become president and where fewer Americans are appalled by this reality than are entertained by its spectacle. I think that really sums up where we are. Yeah, and, and, and I would say, I know, you know, we tend to be Trump obsessed for good reason, and you guys particularly are. I don't, and I don't, I don't denigrate that. It's a world you don't want to live in if you don't have to. Here we are. But the but the problem is not Donald Trump, of course. You know, you know this. Right, bigger. It's bigger. Tens of millions of Americans are buying his swill. They have grievances. They have fears. They have resentments. Some may be based in reality. I think a lot are not. But they're being, you know, exploited and encouraged. By right. the Republican Party. That's what, you know, that was the heart of my book, that for seven decades, the Republican Party has encouraged and exploited this fear, paranoia, resentment, conspiracy theories that are that are out there. And, you know, at times it's done it more than other times. You know, Donald Trump has taken to taken it to the spinal top level of 11 or maybe <laughs> 12, 13 or 14. Uh, but that's, you know, that's the thing, you know, so, so even if anything should happen with Trump and he should decide to disappear or be disappeared, you know, Trump you're still going to have Trump, Trumpism. And that's what we need to think about. That's why I thought the history that I just did with American psychosis gives us some foundations to sort of look at how we got to this point and realize how we as a country need to think about moving on with or without Donald Trump. Well, right. David Korn, we appreciate your effort on that. Everybody check out his book, American Psychosis, a historical investigation on how the Republican Party went crazy. It's out today. David, Looking forward to reading it. Everybody go out and get it at your favorite bookstore or your or your Amazon.com or book Barnes and Noble, wherever it is, wherever you That's buy right. your fine books. That's right. And read David's stuff over there at Mother Mother Jones. Absolutely. He's a good Thanks a lot, great guys. writer. Thank you so much, Thanks, David. David. Yeah, you know, he it, it's 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 a lot, you know, but it's we but the point of the the point of all of us though is that it can be we can stop this. This march toward this this the, down this crazy path can be stopped because I firmly believe there are more of us than them. They they've just been louder and more, you know, organized over the last couple of years uh with some help. And uh, enough is enough. And we saw that. We saw that by taking down Trump in 2020. And we need to continue that effort by taking down his, to David's point, the Trumpists that are now bigger than him that are all running for these offices, which leads me to the latest Lincoln Project ad. Speaking of the crazies, you have these well, crazies hey, out there. That, before we do yep. that, I'd like to read you an email from one of our crazies. Oh, go ahead. Hey, asshole. Just saw your little video about Donald Trump. You keep talking shit like that and things are going to get real ugly for you. And then my address. Oh, oh your actual address. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, folks, this is par for the course. This person and did not manage to uh, use their VPN to block their IP address. So yep. we'll be having a fine afternoon. I'm, lo I'm, I'm looking forward to their, uh, to their afternoon with law enforcement. So. Yeah, Rick, I do not envy you. You get uh, way more uh, vicious attacks like that, doxing than I do, thank God. Um, but I, I wouldn't wish it on anyone. And, um, I always pray for your safety, my friend, because Thank these you. people are nuts. They're nuts. They're, a little bit nuts. they're nuts. And as I was saying, there are some really nutty ones out there in Arizona and, uh, that Carrie Lake and Blake masters and, and, uh, the one running for secretary of state, these are bad people, bad yep. people, literally. And so there are good people running in Arizona. And one of them is the incumbent Senator Mark Kelly, who, by the way, I had the pleasure of watching him in his final mission as an astronaut on the Endeavor 
shuttle take off right. from Kennedy Space Center in 2011, which is one of the most spectacular experiences of my life. It's unbelievable to see a shuttle launch. Um, and I got to see Mark right. Kelly's final final launch. And Mark Kelly is running for re-election for Senate against Blake Masters. And we have give a shout out to Peter Coyote, who voiced this amazing ad called The Right Stuff. Check it out. It's not often Arizona has a leader who's already proven himself in service to our country. That leader is Mark Kelly. Arizona has been lucky to have senators who put country over party and people over politics. Now Mark is ready to carry on that great Arizona tradition. Patriot, U.S. Navy pilot, American astronaut. Tested, courageous, steady. Mark makes Arizona and the country proud. Mark Kelly, a history of service, a record of accomplishment, an independent leader, and a proven American patriot. Here we are in the flight deck of Endeavor, flight day one. Mark Kelly, an Arizona hero who always makes us proud. fantastic fabulous ad man that doesn't make you like be proud to be an american come on arizona do the right thing Kelly in production on that one oh fabulous uh, work fabulous, fabulous work. work you compare that to and peter coyote masters peter, and peter coyote just just absolutely oh, chef's kiss i mean there's nothing there's nothing like that voice it's like chills up your spine every time Absolutely. And we're, we're, we're thankful that he's a, a friend of the Lincoln Project. And also, and lends shout out talent. to Michelle for wrangling all of the moving parts of a very complex production. And 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 I just, it's one of those ones you watch it when it comes out of edit and you're like, oh my God. It I know. <laughs> yes. I had a, pre I got a preview of that because Michelle knows that, um, you know, I'm an amateur yeah. space enthusiast. And I was just like, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Arizona, do the right thing. Hello, you have a great choice out there. Mark Kelly. Blake Masters. All right, guys. Really? Good Lord. Anyway, all right, guys, that's it for our show today. Uh, thank you so much, and we'll see you And Thursday. on Thursday, Rick Wilson unattended. Yes, yes, Rick will. Uh, I will be uh, out of the country on business, and Rick is unattended. So <laughs> I I'll look for the report. Nothing but a bad <laughs> attitude, a pair of boxer shorts. Half a gallon of ketamine. Oh, We're gonna go. <laughs> Good night, everybody. See you guys can hang out with Rick on Thursday. <laughs> <Bye>. <laughs>